pleased to be here today with my colleagues and co-authors, Libby Morgan, Chief Strategy Officer, and Chris Bruderly, Senior Director, Director of Research at the IAB, to present to you IAB's fifth annual Brand Disruption Report. Our goal is to provide you with insights about the top trends animating consumers today and to explore the ramifications up and down the consumer economy supply chain. The entire report is nearly 300 pages long and takes in and makes sense of developments in manufacturing and logistics, media marketing and attention, data usage and deployment, and fulfillment and retail. It's been IAB's research that has introduced into the vernacular the concept of the direct brand economy. Over the past five years, we have shown conclusively that the consumer facing economy in the US is undergoing a reconstruction of its core business creation processes as significant as the first industrial revolution in the mid 19th century. Millions of new companies have been and are being born. Untold numbers of new products and services are being created. In the US, according to research by the IEB and Harvard Business School Emeritus Professor John Dayton, this new market-making economy generated 17 million jobs in the United States last year and 12% of gross domestic product. The IAB 2022 Brand Disruption Report contains lessons and strategies for everyone. For small brands, there are insights that will help you grow beyond your quarter point of market share. For the large brands that have dominated for a century, you will learn how to spark your stagnant growth. Publishers will learn where their next advertising clients will come from and what those clients will need from you. Retailers will learn how consumers are shopping today and the assets you'll need to meet those shoppers' demands. First, I, I wanna give away the ending with the most fundamental lesson we have learned from five years of study. For most of the past century and a half, the consumer economy has been dominated by a handful of giant companies. Only those brands that could be stocked on brick and mortar store shelves could be found. And only those brands that could afford to advertise in expensive national media, especially television, would be stocked in those stores. This media retail cartel has now been broken. The fundamentals of competition have been permanently altered. Consumer demand is being generated and fulfilled in entirely new ways. Longtime dominant brand owners are threatened. Only those that adapt continually will thrive. Let us give you some background and some insights. Indirect brands dominated in the period beginning in 1879 when Procter & Gamble invented ivory soap through about 2010. They created value by dominating owned and operated capital intensive integrated supply chains. They extracted value through a series of third party handoffs from the brand to publishers to retailers. These third party retailers were the essential link between brands and consumers. As recently as 1995, 97% of all retail sales in the US took place inside brick and mortar stores. Brand prosperity during this period depended on a company's ability to dominate two supply chains. There was the supply chain that created and distributed goods and services that's represented on the left of the schematic. And there was the supply chain that generated awareness for those goods and services depicted in the sweep to the right. Beginning around 2010, just the year Warby Parker was founded, direct brands began to power into consumer consciousness. Changes in the industrial infrastructure had made once hard to access enterprise functions available to even the tiniest firms. Direct brands, as we label them, create value through a low barrier, capital flexible, leased or rented, stack your own supply chain. You can put it together yourself. They extract value primarily through the direct relationships they forge between the company and its end consumers, hence the term direct brand economy. Thousands of new brands have been launched on the foundation of the direct brand economy. In our first IAB direct brand study in 2018, we worked with Dun & Bradstreet to identify 5,000 companies that fit the profile that had been established in just the eight years since Warby Parker's founding. That number has only grown by many thousands since. But I wanna caution you that this is not just a story about new small brands. It's a story about the changing competitive dynamics within the consumer economy that are transforming everyone's risks 
and everyone's opportunities. To cite perhaps the most salient data, data point, because the cost of access was so high, conventional television historically supported only the top 200 consumer companies in the United States. By contrast, 10 million companies can afford to advertise and do advertise on the internet. Those companies make an almost unimaginably large and diverse array of products and services. For example, an average Walmart supercenter carries about 142,000 different items on its physical shelves. The Amazon marketplace, again, by contrast, lists 350 million products for sale. And the go-to-market opportunities are greater and infinitely more complex than at any point in the past century. Today, as we speak, there are eight cable television networks in the US with average daily ratings above 1 million households. In comparison, there are 22,000 YouTube channels with more than 1 million subscribers each. Here's why that makes a difference. As physical space expands into virtual space, as the constraints imposed by brick and mortar stores and by the narrow media bandwidth, as those constraints are broken, small companies benefit the most. Here's one ready example. In the cosmetics industry, 96% of all the products sold in brick and mortar stores like Sephora and Bloomingdale's are made by the top 20 manufacturers. In digital stores, those top 20 account for only 14% of sales. 86% of e-commerce cosmetics revenues are generated by small companies. The lesson is profound. Digital consumers, digital supply chain management, digital distribution, digital selling, and digital marketing, what IEB calls the direct brand economy, breaks the century-old media retail cartel. The result is a much more competitive consumer economy. Libby, over to you to describe how competitive it actually is. Thank you, Randall. Direct brands have challenged the status quo. What we'll show you today is how the COVID pandemic massively accelerated the growth of the direct brand economy and reinforced the conditions that enabled its growth. Just how much has COVID sped up the transition to a direct brand economy? Well, it has essentially collapsed three to five years of steady incremental growth into a single year. E-commerce, which has been growing at a clip of about 14% per year for much of the past two decades, grew 32% between 2019 and 2020. Total retail, meanwhile, that is physical and digital together, barely tracks GDP growth in normal years. That means brick and mortar selling is flat. It is a zero growth environment. All the growth in retailing is in e-commerce. Sales have shifted across verticals and industries. The only data points that have gone down slightly are in apparel and automotive. And we can hypothesize the benefits of shopping for apparel in person, such as accurate sizing and shopping with friends, while automotive may be related to supply disruptions and shortages. Omnichannel is now the norm. Local delivery is up 45%, click and collect up 52%, and buy online pickup in store up 125%. Why is this important? Because it means that 168 years of store-centered discovery are over. When we began our research in 2018, on-demand was defined as two-day delivery. By 2019, it has become next-day delivery. In 2020, same-day delivery was the new delivery frontier. Coming into 2021, we now have a two-hour delivery window. As we enter 2022, the delivery frontier is 15 to 20 minutes. One example of 15-minute delivery is New York City-based Joker, which leverages dark stores as micro-fulfillment hubs and e-bikes to get quickly around the city. On-demand is essentially a new category and a massive advertising growth opportunity where there'll be a ton of experimentation. With the commercial vacancy rate up, brands are capitalizing on dark stores to support the on-demand efforts. Dark stores are not open to in-person shoppers as they are only for deliveries. And dark stores saw a 346% increase in US revenues in 2020. Dark startups have raised five times as much funding during the first few months of 2021 as in all of 2020 combined. As consumers return to brick and mortar stores, they expect those stores to be digitally powered ecosystems. Digital conveniences must be embedded into physical stores. And that means features like virtual try-in and smart packaging and automated checkout, among others. And the future is here. Brands such as Amazon Express and Ikea are already supporting these convenient digital features. The direct brand economy has also been responsible for introducing new categories. For example, the fashion, rental, resale, and subscription market, which basically didn't exist in 2020, in 2010, 
now accounts for nearly 10% of the apparel category and is expected to grow to nearly one-fifth of the total market by 2030. Part of this is also because younger consumers aren't focused on purpose, meaning, and the environment. They care about, about brand origin and integrity. As more consumers shop on the endless virtual shelf and are marketed to across seemingly limitless media channels, small companies benefit at the expense of large companies. McKenzie research shows that 77% of consumers experimented with new shopping behaviors during the first year of the pandemic lockdown, and 39% of them tried new brands. And eight out of 10 who tried new brands during the pandemic plan to continue buying. Thanks to the endless virtual shelf, small and extra small CPG brands showed 15 to 20% revenue growth during 2020, twice the growth rates of CPG giants like Procter & Gamble and Unilever. Now, as we have a look at leading disruptor brands, what's notable is that loyalty is being developed in entirely different ways. There's a new mental model happening. The traditional onslaught of advertising and brands powering onto store shelves is not the primary way to gain loyalty with consumers anymore. And these disruptor brands have developed loyalty without relying exclusively on traditional constructs. And as we see the first wave, the disruptors are now household names with notable market share, but right behind those is another wave. Used car sales are blossoming online. Total U.S. seasonally adjusted annual car sales plunged 13% through September of this year after falling 8% in 2020. Now part of this is supply chain, of course. However, used vehicle disruptor Carvana increased units sold by 76% in the first quarter of 2021 and 96% in the second quarter. Carvana's $57 billion stock market valuation now exceeds Ford Motor Company. So an important question. How do the new small disruptor brands become the next Chewy? And how does a brand like Chewy become the next Unilever? Well, what is interesting to see in the momentum gained and the loyalty achieved by this disruptor brands has now allowed them to expand into new product categories. And these disruptor brands are finding space on big box retailer shelves, space long reserved for entrenched brands. Thus, we saw Target partnerships with D2C backpack brand State Bag, sustainable homewares brand Stojo, and pet care brand Jinx. Men's healthcare brand Row rolled out to more than 4,000 Walmart stores. Big brands and retailers have awoken and are now driving the very trends they had been ignoring and resisting for years. Now the largest companies are playing catch up with disruption and what was defined as disruption is now turning into the new mainstream. And we would be remiss if we did not mention the impact of supply chain disruption. Larger brands with their advanced economic forecasting, preferential supplier agreements and cash reserves do tend to be better positioned to weather these challenges. However, we have seen that some small to medium businesses and resellers have found success on marketplaces such as eBay. And now back to Randall. Thanks, Libby. The central driver of the direct brand economy is data. As government regulation, browser clampdowns and consumer behavior changes make third party data harder to use in marketing, it's utterly unsurprising that data lies at the center of every political, industrial, and competitive debate today. Individual companies are furiously trying to make sense of it in order to place bets for their own survival and growth. Let us help you make sense of it yourselves and place some bets. The first lesson, the most important lesson is brands are data companies that make things. That's an inversion of historic strategic and operating norms. Advanced data users like Starbucks See data underlying everything they do, from labor allocation to inventory management to customized product recommendations. Understanding the importance of data, the technology industry is engaged in a frenzied internal battle to commandeer and control data flows. Facebook's perceived weakness in the face of political firestorms over disinformation, misinformation, and privacy has emboldened, emboldened Apple to use the concept of privacy to advance its own control of both third-party data and first-party data in its dominant iOS mobile operating system. Brands have reason to worry about this. Apple's changes in its mobile operating system and apps, particularly, particularly its app tracking transparency feature called ATT, has resulted in iOS addressable audiences shrinking by over 80%. According to research by the ad tech firm Maloco, Apple's changes drove the average conversion costs for 30 global e-commerce marketers up 200% from the start of 2021 through the end of June. 
So material has Apple's impact been that such stock market darlings as Snap and Facebook took hits to their share prices, significant hits. Because of privacy spurred regulation and cookie deprecation, 95% of all brands told IEB that they are adjusting their data strategies. Their top priority is first party data. More than 40% of the buyers we surveyed reported focusing their efforts on gaining more first party consumer relationships and the data that derives from those relationships. Yet, despite the new ardor for first party data, most brands lag in their efforts to collect and deploy it. Even such basic consumer information as transaction history is being gathered by fewer than half the brands that are using first party data. We can go so far as to say that most brands are unsophisticated in their pursuit of first party data. Most of them are using it for managing and measuring old fashioned mass advertising, assessing reach and frequency, for example. Only about a third of brands are using first party data to personalize products and experiences. There's a tremendous need and a tremendous opportunity for brands to upskill their use of data. In the short term, we believe the biggest beneficiary of the data privacy debate will be streaming television networks. CTV advertising has doubled since 2019. A whopping 84% of buyers who are, who are increasing their CTV spend told IEV, IEB that they increase their connected TV ad spend specifically because cookie deprecation was prompting them to look beyond conventional online channels for addressable yet privacy safe alternatives so they can build those first party data relationships. Having given you a rich snapshot of how the direct brand economy is disrupting centuries old conventions in data commerce and consumer activity, we now wanna show you how this phenomenon is being driven in no small part by changes in media consumption patterns. Media consumption and commerce are inextricably linked as we noted earlier, the history of the American brand economy is a history of cartelized control, of limited shore, store shelf space, combining with limited and expensive media bandwidth to limit the brands and products to which consumers were exposed. Today, the endless product and service shelf enabled by e-commerce is matched by a nearly infinite availability of media programming. Together, these have become the primary drivers of brand discovery, brand consideration, and brand choice. First thing I wanna point out is what you think you know is true, is true, and it's even truer than you think. Time spent consuming digital media now far exceeds time spent with analog media. It's 42% more to be exact. The greatest growth in digital media consumption is occurring in vid video, specifically connected TV. Streaming video in particular has been skyrocketing, up 47% in August from the immediate pre-pandemic times in late 2019. Now, it, it wasn't that long ago that many seasoned industry experts assumed all this activity signaled the death knell for advertising. The way the theory went was that inexpensive, non-advertising supported streaming video on demand services called SVODs would vanquish advertising supported services known as AVODs. Now consider this 2014 headline from The Guardian, quote, Netflix and other on-demand services killed the TV ad golden goose. Well, in reality, the opposite happened. Ad supported and commercially affiliated AVODs account for substantially more viewer time than SVODs. Indeed, Ad-supported services are growing at twice the rate of SVOD services, while linear TV continues to decline. Contrary to much of the conventional wisdom over the past several years, we have not only entered a new golden era, era for video, we have entered a new golden era for ad-supported video. Now, to be sure, there are other beneficiaries of consumers' demand for more satisfying and diverse media choices. Digital audio in 2020 surpassed terrestrial radio, as consumers favored audio delivery medium, for example. And within that, podcasting specifically has skyrocketed into the mainstream, providing a monthly escape for 40% of the American population above the age of 12. But right now, the media marketplace is hosting two parallel stories for brand marketers, 
the rise of connected television and the ongoing, albeit evolving, dominance of social marketing. And for that, I'm turning it over to Chris Bruderly. Thanks, Randall. So the key point here is, is that on social is where now content, commerce, and community have merged. And we stated here, and we'll address it in more detail shortly, that direct sales of goods on social grew nearly 40% last year and will reach $80 billion in 2025. So from, from an audience standpoint, social media has already achieved near parity with TV and will likely surpass it in the next few years. And brands back this up. Our 2021 Brand Disruption Survey found that social media was the biggest success driver for them during COVID. So for most of the 20th century, opinion leaders were dependent on the mass media to amplify their message. This has fully changed. Now we see that eight in 10 brands surveyed by IAB report working directly with social media influencers. So opinion leadership no longer depends on mass media gatekeepers and marketers recognize that influence is independent of mass media. We also found in our new IAB brand disruption survey that brands are using more micro and nano influencers during the pandemic. Around 40% more brands are using them today than before. It's not just about attaching your brand to a big name influencer. It's about having an influencer who makes a real connection with your audience and those who will work with you on things like product trials and development. For example, look at how West Elm is enabling social influencers and design professionals to create their own curated product pages on the site. Or how Express is offering influencers sales commissions for products bought from their posts. Or how American Eagle and Twitch are using influencers to co-create gamer outfit collections. Social has even become a key promotional tool in store. Store associates have become excitement generators for what's going on behind the counter. So without question, social influence has been a key success driver for brands during the pandemic. And as we see here, the social platforms are making aggressive moves to optimize this. This advantages platforms that are participation native. In order for legacy media companies to compete in this growing area of the brand economy, they must figure out how to open up their platforms to mass participation. Big brands are already figuring it out in the form of content-driven social community hubs. Kraft Heinz' new What's Cooking platforms enables creators, chefs, and home cooks to learn about ingredients, cuisine, and techniques via videos, while Kraft Heinz products are seamlessly worked in. So as a result of what we've been talking about is this gold rush currently taking place among social media to, to provide direct sales on their platforms. As mentioned earlier, growth is, product, growth is projected to be strong. But there's another dynamic occurring here. Social media is shaping commerce. Even Amazon has embraced TikTok as a discovery aid engine. Hashtags with billions of views are pumped into Amazon and are leading to sales. The largest brick and mortar store in the country sees this opportunity. Walmart's four walls channel on TikTok is a Gen Z, this old house. And perhaps the merger of content, community, and commerce has its best current realization in the growth of live streaming, which has been one of the biggest breakthroughs of the pandemic, offering every brand and retailer the opportunity to be its own QVC. Live stream sales revenues are projected to double this year to $11 billion and more than double again in 2023. Fashion and beauty brands are most aggressively leaning in. Both Nordstrom and Bloomingdale's have announced 50 plus interactive live stream events, while Macy's presented its first event in March. Finally, online gaming, which may be the ultimate digital social activity, has become almost ubiquitous as television with nearly 200 million active users. It's not surprising, especially on Twitch, that brands as diverse as Lexus and Tampax are leaning in. And now, as we look at the impact of all of this on ad spend front, we see that it will increasingly migrate towards media that enable some form of combination of social activity, entertainment, and commercial transactions. So per Magna, spending has more than recovered from the pandemic. Digital is up 52% versus 2019, and helping to keep total spending up 24%, despite the shrinkage in linear. So not surprisingly, new IB research among more than 300 media spend decision makers shows that three-fourths of total ad spending is going to digital channels. And within digital channels, here's what follows. Again, per Magna, 
video and social are the biggest beneficiaries of this spending, forecast to be up 69% and 65% respectively versus 2019. Not too far behind is audio, which includes music and podcasting, and is projected to be up 49%. And we must address the rise of retail media networks, a perfect iteration of the merger of commerce and content. So faced with competition from Amazon and to a need to adjust for the lack of in-store brand interaction, retailers are doubling down on monetizing their digital shelf via their own retail media networks. Brand investment is up 56% versus 2019 in terms of share of budget. Retailers are going all out to win these dollars and are starting to win. Additionally, per IB research, the retailers are more likely to require retail media trade support from the big brands than from the smaller brands. We think this is evidence of the smaller brands needing the retailers less due to their appeal to younger, digitally savvy shoppers and their ability to use their e-com expertise to bypass the larger retailers. Finally, we have talked about it in the past and continue to believe that shoppable ad formats will help fuel the next wave of growth in digital video. Half the buyers surveyed in IEB's Fall 2021 Impact Survey said they plan to invest in shoppable ads next year and increase investments by 17% after a 23% rise this year. Now let me hand it back to Libby for the challenges and opportunities moving forward. Thank you, Chris. First of all, the world is not divided into e-commerce versus brick and mortar. Omnichannel shopping is the new norm for consumers. Making all your channels align for growth means capturing consumer data and activating insights to strengthen relationships. Second, commerce is inherently social. Whether through nano influencers or interactive live streams, social engagement must be embedded in all the brand's channels and experiences. Third, brand loyalty can still be a powerful growth contributor, but amid unprecedented competition, brands can no longer rely on advertising dominance and share of shelf control. Purpose, transparency, services, and responsiveness are important values for consumers. Fourth, brands need a first party data strategy now and an ID solution right now. And you need a contextual advertising strategy that's built on something more concrete than reach and frequency. And finally, Brands, media, and their partners have entered a period of supply chain complexity, risk, and opportunity. You are only as good as your ingredients, your customer satisfaction, and your socially amplified word of mouth. Supply chain challenges require flexibility, workarounds, and especially transparency. Your consumers will increasingly demand that you be transparent about the sources of your raw materials, product availability, delivery times, and your company's values. Thanks, Libby, and thanks, Chris, and thank you to everyone attending the IEB 2021 Brand Disruption Summit. This report in all of its 300 odd pages, but especially focused on what we've just shown you, uh, will be up on the IEB website for your uh, perusal. Uh, we look forward to hearing back from you. We look forward to speaking to many of you more during the next three days and over the course of the next year as you continue to disrupt the consumer brand marketplace and also disrupt yourselves for the benefit of jobs and the economy. Thank you very much.